don't have where's offering oh okay
Good morning. And if you're still looking for a place to sit down, that's okay. There's plenty of space right here in the front if you want. <laughs> My name is Reverend Melanie Marshbaum, and I am one of the ministers here at Community Presbyterian Church, and it is my joy to welcome you to worship on this Sunday morning, the fourth Sunday of Advent, when we are celebrating the spiritual discipline of proclaiming, proclaiming the good news of Christ's arrival to all of the world in the fashion of John the Baptist, who we will be learning and focusing on today. And we are excited to be in the midst of this Advent season with you. This is the last Sunday before Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, and we hope that you will join us, whether online or in person, for any of our several Christmas Eve offerings on Thursday evening. Um, we have a 3 to 5 p.m. walking nativity that is family friendly for anyone who has young kids. We usually do a very large and raucous um, children's family worship service where everyone puts on a costume and everyone comes forward to be part of the nativity. We've modified that a little in the spirit of this unconventional year and we're going to be walking around the outdoor parts of our campus and learning about the story of Jesus' birth. And then we have our traditional um, and contemporary candlelight services and the evening vespers that will take place at nine o'clock with communion. So with all of these things, bursting us at the seams this week and um, in our hearts and minds, let us open our worship with prayer. Here and now we would prepare the way for our God. We make straight in the desert a highway. Let us proclaim the name of the Holy One who is to come. Let us pray together. God of the ages who danced over the waters at the dawn of time, Take our hands and lead us in your dance of creation. When we are uncertain, guard our hearts with your peace. When our steps falter, surround us with the strength of your spirit. Guide us, dancing God, until we move and sing with the joy of your salvation. In the name of Emmanuel, God with us, we pray. Amen. Amen. And I invite the Meyer Dirks family to join us at the uh, Advent wreath in the tables. They will be helping us through our call to worship and lighting of the Advent candles. <laughs> to bind up the brokenhearted. Come, Lord, and make all things new. For past wrongs that prevent us from moving forward. Come, Lord, and make all things new. For any bitterness that scratches our soul. Come, Lord, and make all things new. For relationships left in decay and neglect. Come, Lord, and make all things new. For any action that has wounded us or by which we have wounded others. Grant that we might have the peace of Christ as we wait, the love of Christ as we act, and the grace of Christ as we speak. This morning we light four candles. The first candle is the light of hope 
for those in times of waiting. The second candle is the light of hope for those who are wearied by the circumstances of life. The fourth candle is the light of hope for those who carry the wounds of life. Today we acknowledge our pain and the pain we have caused others. As the light shines, we turn to the Savior who came to recuse the lost, to help the hurting, and to bind up the broken. this journey of life, we fall, we stumble, we forget our way. Let us now join together in confessing before God and one another all that separates us from the love of God. Holy and merciful one, smooth down the mountains of our pride and lift up the valleys of our doubts. Open a path in the wilderness for our lives, that we might find our way to you again. Refine us and prepare us for life in your beloved kingdom. In your mercy, hear our prayers, which we offer to you in the silence of our hearts. Friends, hear this good news. There is nothing in life or in death that can separate us from the love of God through Christ our Redeemer. As redeemed and reconciled members of the family of God, let us share a sign of Christ's peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. I invite you to stand where you are and wave or share a peace sign or other sign of Christ's peace with each other. as we enter into our time for all ages and for especially our youngest disciples and worshipers who may be worshiping in person or online with us this morning, I want us to think about this season that is ending tonight um, into tomorrow, the season of fall. Now here in Florida, we don't really get the same kind of seasons that people get in much of the rest of the world. And we may not have ever really noticed animals and other parts of creation preparing themselves for winter. But if you've ever lived someplace where it does get cold and snowy in the winter time, or maybe in your travels, you've noticed and seen animals preparing themselves for the cold. Birds fluff up their nests with feathers and extra bits of comforting warm things so that their eggs and their little um, bird bodies will be warm throughout the winter. Other animals build nice small little cozy dens in the ground or inside of a tree. Or maybe 
as you've been walking on the beach in Atlantic Beach, you've been lucky enough to see a sea turtle nest where a mother sea turtle has prepared a space for her eggs to be laid. Or maybe around our houses over the last couple of weeks, we've been making some preparations too. Like how many of us have maybe put up some lights on our house or put up a nativity set somewhere in our house? Or how many of us have put up a Christmas tree and maybe even started to put some gifts underneath it already? You have? Well, however we prepare ourselves for this season, our story today is about another person who was preparing. In today's gospel lesson, we learn about John the Baptist. And John came to prepare for the arrival of Jesus. Now in the Bible, it tells us that John said, prepare the way of the Lord. So how do you think John prepared? Do you think he used feathers and sticks? Do you think he built a cozy den in the ground or lit up lights or put presents under a tree? Do you think so? No, maybe, well, maybe he didn't. <laughs> That's probably true, maybe he didn't. But John moved people's hearts with his words and he helped us all to prepare for the good news given to him by the Holy Spirit of God which was that Jesus was coming to share God's love with, as they say in the Bible, all of humankind, which basically is just a really fancy way of saying all of us, for you and you and all of you and for me and for Azar too, yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Even me. Yes. <laughs> and that is what we are called to do now too. We are called to proclaim whatever good news God has given us in this day, in this season, and always. So let us pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending us Jesus to show us what your love looks like in human form. Help us to proclaim that love in our words and in our actions everywhere we go, with everyone we meet. Amen. Amen. So as we pre prepare our, ourselves to give, go to God with our tithes and our offerings, um, I got to get on to you a little bit. Um, this week I was talking to Melanie and Melissa, and they said, you know what, we're not taking up the Christmas joy offering Christmas Eve. I said, what? And they said, no, we're taking it up to this coming Sunday, today. And I'm like, nobody called me, nobody corrected me, nobody sent me an email or a text, you know, hey, town clown, we're, we're not doing it on Christmas Eve, we're doing it today. So 21 years, you guys don't feel like you need to correct me or anything, you just let me get up here and ramble and just make a fool of myself, I appreciate it very much. But, uh, so today, we're taking up the Christmas joy offering, okay, and remind you what it's all about. Uh, I don't need that either, Thomas, thank you. Um, <clears throat> 50% of your gifts go toward helping those in college, okay? And then 50% of your gift go toward um, helping retired uh, Presbyterian workers who are facing some challenging times, especially this day and time with, with COVID and everything. So the, there's, an op, there's an offering envelope in the back, um, and you can also um, give on our website, if you would, or our Facebook page. So let's go to God in prayer. For all the ways that you support us, we appreciate it. Gracious and eternal God, we give you thanks for all the ways that you bless us. So as we come to you this morning, we offer ourselves, our gifts, our talents, our money. And we ask that you continue to use that to spread your, your message of joy and peace throughout the world. And in Christ's name we pray, amen.
friends, as we continue worship this morning, let the words of our first, second, and third scripture readings fill your hearts and minds. A reading from Psalm 145, verses 4 through 6. One generation shall laud your work to another, and one shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. The might of your awesome deeds shall be proclaimed, and I will declare your greatness. Our second scripture reading comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 5 and 11 to 14. Listen now for the word of God as it came to Zechariah. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Then there appeared to Zechariah an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayers have been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Our third scripture reading comes from us from Luke chapter 3, verses 2 through 6. Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests, and at this time the word of God came to the John, the son of Zechariah, in the desert. He went over all the sea around Jordan the river, preaching a baptism of changed hearts and lives for the forgiveness of sins. As is written in the book of Isaiah, the prophet, the voice of one who calls out in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make the road straight for him. Every valley should be filled in, every mountain and hill should be made flat. Roads with turns should be made straight, and rough roads should be made smooth. And all people will know about the salvation of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Nadine Curry was 13 years old, about five foot two and weighed soaking wet, about 100 pounds. Nadine and his family had escaped war-torn Liberia, Liberia, thank you. I'll get it out. Once in America, his family had settled in Philadelphia, and, and that was in 2011. And in Naden found himself to be the new kid on the block in Philly whose mother was an African immigrant looking for work. The kind of kid that bullies target. They could see him coming from a million miles away. So one day, for 30 minutes, seven teenage bullies kicked and beat Naden, dragged him through the snow, stuffed him into a tree, and hung him on a seven-foot tall spike fence. Naden survived the attack, and it had not been for the foolishness of one of the boys who filmed it with his phone and put it on YouTube. Sure enough, cops found it, saw the, saw the uh, video, and arrested the bullies. A worker at a TV show there in Philadelphia, uh, of a TV show called The View, um, called, Naden, um, called Naden and asked him to come to the TV show to be interviewed about the incident. What Naden didn't know was that they also invited seven Philadelphia Philly football players, Philadelphia Eagles football players, to come and, and be on the show with him. All right. So when he was sharing his story, one of the, re- one of the uh, receivers named Deshaun Jackson leaned over to Naden and said, Naden, I'm here for you, man. I got your back. Anytime you need me, you call me. And he wrote down his cell phone number and gave it to Naden in front of all the bullies in Philadelphia. (laughs) Bullies have a tendency of staying away from a kid like that, you know, when you got somebody in your back pocket like those boys. 
We've all had our fair share of bullies. The mental battles of sin and shame that push us around. Guilt and blame. The biggest bully on the block, however, is introduced in the New Testament as the devil and Satan. And Jesus calls him that, and that's how we're introduced to him. Jesus also says that he's a thief, a liar, and he comes to steal, steal, kill, and to destroy. Destroying lives by stealing their hope, stealing their faith, and killing their dreams. Lying to people about their self-worth and their abilities. Hitting people with his lies and then rubbing their face in the dirt of their failures. He only comes to destroy. So people run. And they run some more. And they keep on running. Looking and running to activities or people or things to protect themselves. And to get some sort of relief from the bullying. That's why God sent a man named John, John the Baptist. In the first two verses of, of chapter 3, Luke provides the setting for us, answering the questions of what, when, who, and where. This was through the proclamation of an angel. When the word of the Lord came to John in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, or somewhere around about 29 A.D. Who? Luke tells us that John is the son of Zechariah. Reminding us of the amazing intervention between Zechariah and Elizabeth. Where? At the end of Luke 1, John is a young boy in the wilderness waiting for his public appearance to Israel. Now at the beginning of Luke 3, as I just read, John is still in the wilderness, but the waiting is over. John's ministry of proclaiming has begun, and his ministry is, is for people who are on the run. The what? John's proclamation of the salvation of God through Jesus Christ, God's Son. That's the what. John's salvation proclamation is this. All flesh will see the salvation of our God. Great news for people then and today. Salvation is for all people. All people. Even though those who feel like they are running for their lives. People running from problems that no one understands. People running from bad relationships, bad feelings, bad breakups, and bad breaks in life that have come to them at times. People run from a painful past, a perplexing presence, and then a future that looks like it's a train wreck of just about to happen. For such people, John is proclaiming there is salvation. <clears throat> All flesh shall see the salvation of our God. The shepherds see the salvation. Simeon says, my eyes have seen your salvation. Fishermen, tax collectors, and sinners all see God's salvation. And from a sycamore tree, a little man climbs up, and he sees the salvation of God. The angel comes to us and says it on Christmas. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. So when people are struggling or hounded by sin and shame, Guilt and blame, too often they run to the wrong places looking for some, some sort of salvation or relief. They look to, to, for people for their affirmation. They look to their jobs, to their accomplishments, so, to their money and all the stuff that they have around them. And these are good gifts. Nothing wrong with them whatsoever. They're grand gifts, but they're not salvation. They're not salvation. There's only one salvation that can defeat evil, demons, and darkness. There's only one salvation that can bring peace, hope, and assurance of a future, healing from the past, and strength to stand in the face of the future. But, but people can be self-deceived, like I was saying. To, to the Pharisees, John, he noticed that they were self-deceived. He said they looked at John. They said, you know, we have our father Abraham. John says, don't, think, don't tell me that you have your father Abraham. God is able to raise up people from the stones that are around here. You see, they thought just because they were people of the covenant that they, did, they, they, were, um, they didn't need the, the salvation that Jesus brought. They also didn't think that they needed to be accountable for any of their actions. They were granted a place in the covenant, they thought. Along with their belief, John tells them this. Or, yeah, John says that that is not salvation. That salvation only comes from God's grace. Not just by grace, but by God's grace. God's amazing and life-changing grace. John says that through repentance and baptism, which our roles are completely passive and surrender to God's love, we distance ourselves from our past ways of sin and profess our allegiance to the coming one, Jesus. Jesus, who is the Savior of all of mankind, 
the Jesus that will usher in God's grace and God's favor. John announced to them, I baptize you with water, but there's going to come one after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to loosen, who's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John says, I'm not the Christ. I'm just a proclaimer of the one who's coming after me. He is the, the Davidic leader, deliverer, and king. He is the one that has all the power. So Jesus comes, and Jesus fights bullies on behalf of all mankind. And in Luke 4, we see Jesus in the wilderness facing this bully, and he tells the bully three times it is written, and he defeats him three different times. It is written, it is written, it is written. Throughout Luke's gospel, we see where Jesus cast out devils and demons. He bound strong men. Jesus proclaims also in the temple the salvation of our God. Jesus brings to us our salvation, our restoration, and then finally our final resurrection. Jesus defeated people for, for everyone. You, for all the yous in the world. You with the broken past, you with the aging body, you with the absentee father, you with the bad hair, you with the lost job, you with the bad back, the bad credit score, and the bad grades. All the yous in the world. Jesus fights for all of us. And then Jesus turns and gives us his number on speed dial. I'll never leave you or forsake you. So the story is told of a young man. I, I tagged him. I titled him Reed because I know some very cool kids who are Reeds. Okay, But he had a cute little beagle dog. And the dog's name was Howard. And Howard could run. Howard could run fast. Howard, Reed would take Howard running with him. And he said, before you knew it, we could knock out eight miles, put eight miles behind us in no time flat. Howard loved to run, and he was a good runner. There was a problem with Howard. Howard liked to run away. So one summer day, Howard was running away again. And here goes Reed right after him. He said he almost, got, he almost caught up to Howard. He got within 10 feet of that dog, and he stopped. And they looked at each other face to face. Howard looked at him. And Reed said that he had two choices. He could do what I tell you, call, come to him, or he could run. What do you think Howard did? <laughs> Howard takes off running all over again. And we all kind of have dogs like that or seen them running down, running down the block. People keep up, people are the same way. They run, and they keep on running. From the bully on the block, the father of lies, trying again to rub their faces in the dirt of guilt and shame and disappointment and failure, holding them captive. But people ha don't have to keep running in life, and that's our proclamation to them. And why is that? Because God sent Jesus, the Redeemer, the salvation for all of mankind, and he sent John the Baptist in the wilderness to proclaim the salvation for all people, telling us all, we all need to repent and return to the Savior, Jesus Christ, and that is what we proclaim. John's ministry had proclamation is, is done, and now it's our turn to declare to the world you don't have to keep running anymore and that the, the bully has been beat. Jesus invites everyone to turn around, to stop running, look him in the face, and hear his word when he says, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Just like Navy didn't have to fear those bullies anymore, neither do we and neither do people. They don't have to face the fear of being bullied anymore that makes them feel unworthy and useless. We are redeemed and we are free and we are God's own people. And that's what we proclaim today. The battle is the Lord's. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, thank you for sending your son Jesus Christ. And we look for his coming in our lives this Advent season in a more powerful way. This is our proclamation that you've sent your son into the world for, to redeem all mankind. They have been set free. They just don't know it. And, oh, God, empower us to be your people, to let the world know of your redeeming love. And in Christ's name we pray, amen.
As we do every week, we now turn our hearts and minds toward prayer for our own community and the members within our congregation, for our community outside these walls, and for the larger world and all of God's family. I remind you that if you would like to pray along with us throughout the week, we have a paper version of our prayer list that is available in the narthex on the back table. And it is also available via email if you want to contact us to be included on that email list. I have a few joys and concerns to update you on this morning. We pray, continue to pray for the family of Rick H who passed away last week after a long battle with cancer. And we pray for the family of Reverend Tom, who is our colleague at Neptune Baptist Church, who passed away earlier this week from complications due to COVID-19. And our thoughts and prayers and our hearts are with his family and with their congregation at Neptune Beach Baptist during what is going to be now a very different and difficult holiday season. We pray for the family of Kobe S., who passed away this week, whose mother was a beloved teacher at Atlantic Beach Elementary School, for the family of Maggie P., who passed away on December 9th, and we pray for the family of Clara P., who passed away at 97 years young this week, and we give thanks for her long life. We pray with and for Susan M. and her husband Bob, as Susan is facing some medical challenges in this time, and we give our thanks to God for Mary Lee H. and for Diane R., both of whom celebrated another circle around the sun this year, today, this week, sorry. And um, we give thanks for the joy and wonderfulness that they bring to our community. With all of these things in our hearts and in our minds, let us now go to God in prayer. Good and gracious God, grant us a glimpse of your glory, that we may rejoice in your presence and abide in your peace. Emmanuel, God with us, we remember at this time that you came into the world to shake things up and to turn the lives of all humankind to God. You brought love to those who were unloved, hope to those who had nothing to look forward to, peace to those who were full of anxious daily cares. And you also brought the warning of judgment to those who thought that they knew better, those who assumed that they were the good ones, those who were content with their own lives and those who believed they knew everything there was to know about our mysterious God. We pray that you will enter into our lives here and now. Help us to see ourselves and love ourselves as we really are. Help us to see your spirit in those around us. Help us to know the joy of your loving presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for all of those who are crying out for your mercy, your comfort, your healing and your peace. We pray especially for Kenneth S., for the family of Rick and Tom and Kobe and Maggie, for the family of Clara, for Susan and Bob. We give you thanks for Mary Lee and for Diane. We pray for all of those facing medical challenges, including Dave and Doug and Bob and Harriet, Henry and Francis, Dan, Judy, Jeannie, Richard, Jackie, Jeremy, Carol, and Diane. We pray for those who are having surgery or are recovering from surgical procedures, for Irvin and Peter and Shirley and Bob, Michelle, Meg, Diane, and Vicki. And we pray for those who are struggling and in need of peace, for Kimmy and her mother, Barb, for Helene and Beverly and Bruce. Lord Jesus, we pray that you will prepare us to receive you. Accompany us, O oh God, through the waiting. Accompany those who are displaced and waiting to return to their homes or their land. 
Accompany those in refugee camps who are waiting to go back to their families. Accompany those in conflict zones who are waiting for normalcy. Accompany those in violent homes who are waiting for peace. Accompany those who are imprisoned who are waiting for justice. Accompany us, O oh God, through the waiting until your kingdom comes. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're all looking at each other like, what's next? Okay. So, as you prepare to leave, I leave you with the words from Paul to the church at Corinth. Be alert, continue in the faith, have courage and be strong, and do everything in love. Amen? Amen. Go in peace. Merry Christmas.